As the owner of a commercial lawnmower, getting the most from your hydro system is important to you. Hi, I'm Ed from Wright. When I first started working for Wright when I was in school, one of my summer jobs was to refurbish mowers that came back to the factory. And I saw machines that had a lot of hours on them, had been well maintained, and the hydro system was still in pretty good shape. I also saw machines that come in that had been run really hard and had poor maintenance, and the complete hydro system had to be replaced. Ever since that experience, I've been passionate about what can be done to get the most life from your hydro system. As a business owner and landscaper, oftentimes you have to make tough decisions based on technical information. For example, if you have a truck that's getting high in miles and the transmission goes out, you have to decide, is it worth it to rebuild the transmission, put it back in, or do I go ahead and buy another truck? Well, a mower at some point in time, you're gonna to have to face a major technical repair. And this video is not really how to on those repairs, but it's a technical knowledge base so you can best make those decisions. We're gonna look at the system as a whole, some key parts inside the pumps, the motors. We're gonna look at oil and some tips on how to operate the machine to get the most life out of your hydros. Let's first look at the major components in the system. Here we have the right pump powering the right motor. We have the left pump powering the left motor. And it's connected with two high pressure hoses. We also have the control arm. So this is forwards and reverse. We have a bypass valve. So when we open this up, that lets oil bypass so we can move the machine around the shop. We have the cooling fan. We also have a reservoir. So this reservoir supplies oil to the charge system through this line, goes through the filter into the charge pump, and the case drain comes out the side, returns to the tank. Now let's look overall how the system works. Here we have the high pressure lines. The oil can flow forwards and backwards. This is the right side of the machine, left side of the machine, and we're looking at the back of the mower. When oil flows forwards, the axle turns forwards. When the oil flows backwards, the motor turns backwards. This is the main circuit in the machine. There's a right circuit and a left circuit. Now let's look at how the pump pumps the main circuit. So here we have the arm that the control levers are tied to, and that moves this cradle on the bottom here. And that cradle have different angles to it. So here it's angled this way. And when the shaft turns this, you can see those pistons riding uphill on the front side and on the back side they're going downhill. When they ride uphill, they're pumping pressure into the head of this pump. So that pressure goes up to this port and this port goes to the motor. And oil coming back goes to this port as the pistons drop and it just keeps circulating that oil in a loop. Now, you get instant reverse, really fine control with a system like this when you have your control lever tied to this uh, angle of this plate. Very, very fine control. So that's the main loop. Now, there's actually a second pump here, right in the top here. We call it the charge pump. Uh, before we talk about that, this here is about 10 to 15 gallons per minute, um, which you can think of that, it's about like a garden hose, about that much oil. All right, so a little pump here. This pump pumps between 0.2 and 0.5 gallons per minute, so it's a pretty, pretty slow pump, and it's creating a charge pressure. So it's pulling oil down from the tank, clean, fresh oil through the filter into the charge pump. This charge pump will push oil into whichever of the main hoses has lower pressure. There's two little check valves. We'll look at that in a second. It also bypasses a few parts for cooling and drains into the case. And when it's done in the case, it comes back up to the tank. So let's look at that second pump on the charge circuit. So oil from the tank is coming in this rear port right here, and it flows up into the head where this gear, which the pump is, this is pumping charge oil, and that charge oil goes into a center galley right here. And this center galley has check valves that lead into the main ports here and here. Whichever is the lower pressure side, it's gonna let some oil in, and there's a little tiny bleed by orifice that lets oil leak down into the case. Now, there's also a little bit of lubricating oil coming past these pistons, a tiny, tiny amount, and also across the top of the head. And all that oil is coming down into the case, and then from there, it goes back to the tank through this port. So this port is connected to the case, and uh, that oil goes back to the tank for cooling. So that's the charge circuit. Uh, it's very important that it's not pulling any air in, or else you have air in the system. 
and that has good flow uh, for filtration. All right, now that we know how the flow works, let's take apart a pump. Let's look at all the key parts. We'll look at what wears out and what can be repaired and what's not worth repairing. I'm not going to be specific about part numbers because all different brands have different specs and configurations. We'll put a couple of things in the description to show you uh, what could lead you to some specific things with right mowers. Um, but here you have a, a tag that gives you the configuration of the pump and that'll tell you what parts are used to service it. Also before opening up a pump, you want the work area to be really clean. You want to take them off in the same order. I always take parts off, lay them left to right, top to bottom. So when I put it back together, I can go backwards. If I have to pause, I take a picture of those parts so that they don't get lost or out of order. So uh, we're going to break this thing down. Our tools are clean. We've got a clean work service, um, starting with the fan cover. Remove the fan. All right, I'm going to mark the charge cap, so when I put it back on, it'll face the exact same direction. If any of this is backwards, it won't run correctly. Now there's a little ball and spring under here, so I'm going to lift it very carefully so as to not damage it. So here's the charge pump. You can see that that center hole is off center. The star will spin here, but the ring turns off center, which causes the oil pump to flow. Here we can see the charge pump mechanism, the little spring. This should be in good condition. There shouldn't be any scoring. Here's a little ball. You don't want to lose this. All right, now we can remove the head. All right, you want to lift this very carefully because you don't want to bring the cylinder block with it or else all the pistons will fall out. So here we have the head. Now what's important to look at here is there should be any significant scoring in this head. That'll create leakage uh, past. If there is heavy scoring in here, then you're better off just starting over with a new pump. Here we have the cylinder bore. Remove this very carefully so you don't lose any parts. It's best to keep these intact. No reason to have all the pistons come out. Really don't want to get debris in the gap there. So if there's any scoring in here, again, that's bad. These should move freely with no binding or friction. And the surface of the cylinder barrel should be nice and clean, again, with no scoring or heavy wear. Now down the bottom, we have the bearing. We have the top bearing where the pistons run. All this should be in good shape and intact. The spring and the washer that goes underneath it that holds the barrel against the head. And we'll go ahead and pull up the cradle. This bearing should be in good shape. These should be real smooth. And you can see down in here, you have the cradle bearing surfaces. They should be nice and smooth as well. Now, up until this point, this pump could be serviced while still in most machines. You can take the head off and replace this gasket. There's a gasket set that you can get with all the seals and gaskets in the pump. Here's the gasket for the top. So, 
this top seal could be replaced uh, while the pump's still in the machine. Also, there's a bottom seal and a side seal here on, on the side of the shaft. Again, this bottom seal, if this were to blow out or be worn, worn out, you can replace it. In most machines, it's pretty hard to get to, but the advantages of doing it in the machine, the cleanliness uh, can really pay off. So here we've removed the shaft. If the seal is worn, you're going to want to check that the bearing is in shape. A worn bearing can lead to seal failure. So if you replace the seal, you want to be sure that's no excessive play. And there's a small washer that goes behind the seal. Now the general rule of thumb for a pump is if any rubber materials are worn, it's worth fixing. If any of your metal parts are worn, like the cylinder head uh, barrel or the cylinder head, then it's generally worth it, not worth repairing. You just want to replace the whole thing. Um, also, if you have a seal failure, but that pump has a lot of hours on it, then you could be putting a lot of labor into replacing a seal when you may as well just go ahead and replace the pump since you're in there anyways. Uh, so those are some considerations, some things to look for in the pump. Now let's look at some of the critical components inside of a motor. There's generally two kinds of motors. You can have a piston type motor or a gear roller type motor. The advantage to a piston type motor is that they're really efficient, give you really good torque, and they run really cool. The advantage to a gear roller is that you can fit them in really tight areas and uh, they're very easy to apply. There's not a lot of moving parts. Now, in a piston type motor, we have something that's very similar to a pump back here. We have the pistons that run around on their cylinders and that's a high speed unit in the back. So up front what we have is we have planetary gear reduction. That gives you a ton of torque. We use this motor on our ZK and um, one of the unique things there is actually this whole cavity doubles as the reservoir. This is also very similar to what you would see in, t in a mower that has a Hydro Gear 5400 transaxle in it. Um, that's, this is the motor end of something like this. Uh, um, the motor like this, very similar to what you'd see um, real commonly in our industry with Parker or Hydro Gear. Um, so we're going to break down this and show you what's inside. So first off, when you remove a motor like this from a mower, you want to be sure to use a heavy duty puller. If you use a light gear puller, it can fly off, it can injure you. So you want to use a real heavy duty puller. And also when you pull the hub, you want to leave the castle nut on here so when the hub breaks loose, it doesn't actually come off. It just comes loose, then you can back the nut off. Uh, that's a much more safe way to do that. So we'll start on the front end here, and we'll remove the front seal cap. So your roller motor, typically, if you have a leak, it's going to come from one of a few places. It could either be your low pressure end with this shaft seal here. You can get a seal kit and easily replace that. And you have an O-ring here. You have um, a few seals back in here. So if you have a wheel motor that leaks, chances are that it could be repaired. On the nose, we have the bearing. So this is the shim here is the front bearing race. And then inside here, we have the, the needle bearing, the thrust bearing. These bearings can also be replaced. Although that's not as common of a repair. All right, so now we'll open up the back end. Now before I actually take this off, I'm going to mark it. If any of these parts are not put on in their same order, it won't work correctly. You'll see what's going on with some of the porting and indexing here in a second.
All right, so this is the amazing part. Here's your end cap. There shouldn't be any aggressive wear in the end of it. And uh, you have an O-ring here. Again, the O-ring could be serviced. Set that aside. So here's your driving unit. You have a star-shaped unit that moves around in here and creates the torque on the motor. This should be fairly tight-fitting snug. If it's loose, then there could be leakage. Um, also, when you pull it out, this one was worn, and you can see there's real slight ridging in this thing. If there's ridging or there's galling across the tops, that means that there's leakage going around in this, and uh, that will prevent it from working correctly. So going further up, spacer plate. And just point of interest is that different motors out there have different displacements. And typically you can see if a motor matches your same displacement, if this section is longer or shorter. So here we have the drive link or the drive shaft. This engages this star. And as this star moves around, this shaft gives a flex coupling. All right, so now we'll remove the shaft. And you have a needle bearing back in here. And we have needle bearing here. This is very sharp. So amazing thing about this is here you have grooves in this that create the porting. So your main ports here feed oil into these channels. And then there's a series of holes all around the perimeter that force oil through these channels into the different cavities around the droller. So your main pressure is here, and oil is shuttled into those valves. And as this spins, this is like a commutator, and it channels the correct oil to the correct port as the axle spins. There is the same, there's two grooves for every lobe on the star, but in the ring, there's one extra. So this star has six points, to be 12 ports here. This has seven points, one extra, and so there's seven ports on the outside. And as that center 12 goes against the 14 outer ports, it always creates pressure in front of the star as the star spins around in there like this. So those are the major part of this. If this, if this driving end in the back is worn, then you want to just get rid of the motor and start over again. If you have a bearing issue with a real heavy mower maybe, or um, you have a seal issue, that can be repaired. The other uh, nuance to this is we have high pressure oil in the back of this motor, and that high pressure oil, there's a small amount that always be leaking into the nose of this. So that oil that leaks into the nose, it goes into these two little ports, past these check valves, and up to the main ports. So whichever of these two ports has less pressure, the oil inside the nose will go into that port. If you ever have an issue where your machine may have power in one direction, but in the other direction, there's a possibility there could be something forcing one of those to be open. So those are the major part of the moat, parts of the motor. Hopefully that gives you a sense of, of what's going on in there. So here we have a transaxle. This is a Hydrogear 3400 integrated transmission. And this has all the same major components as a pump and motor system. Here you have the pump group. You can see when I rotate this control here, that changes your forward and reverse motion. The piston group. And you have a motor group in here, which is actually just like a pump running backwards. And it's spinning this high speed gear here, giving you a low speed reduction at the axle. Instead of having hoses between the pump and motor, it's all one block right here. You have a charge pump, just like you would on a pump and motor system, and a filter that uh, supplies this charge pump. A system like this has some pros and cons. One of the pros is that everything is in one package unit. So everything's very clean and, and uh, con contained. The thing, other thing about it is it's more hard to diagnose if, if there's a failure, if it's a pump or a motor, because it's in one box. Uh, this can be a little more intimidating to open up. There's a few things that can be serviced in here. 
but given the cost of a transmission versus labor to repair one, typically if you have a transmission issue with the pumper motor group, it's better just to buy a new transmission if it's leaking for some reason or you have a bearing, uh, an output bearing that is worn. That's something that uh, your dealer could easily replace. Now let's talk about diagnostics. Diagnostics are important because if they're not done correctly, it can cost you a lot. Uh, the failure modes generally break into several big categories. First off, we can have passive leaks. So passive leaks are anything that's going to leak while the motor's sitting overnight or while the engine's running, but not necessarily tied to torque in the wheels. Uh, those kinds of leaks would come from any kind of hose connection coming from the tank. It could be a housing seal. It could be a shaft seal. It could be a seal on the side of the arm here. Um, and those kinds of leaks, generally they can be repaired without replacing a major part. It's going to take some labor to get in there. Now, your other category of leaks are your leaks, active leaks when you're under power or torque. So when you dr drive the machine or you go up an incline, oil starts coming out of the mower. That's going to be on your high pressure side. And that's generally going to be either your fittings, your hoses attached to the motor, or it could be on the rotor end of the motor here. So under high pressure, you have oil leaking past. It may also be associated with a leak on the nose. Generally, these, though, are slow and steady leaks if you have a leak at the, at the front nose of the motor. Now, your third kind of major failure can be loss of power. Loss of power, you move the controls and the machine is not going or it's weak. Um, one thing about loss of power is, is if you begin experiencing loss of power, don't keep driving that machine. What could be a, a smaller issue will quickly become a bigger issue because when you have loss of power, generally you're going to end up with contaminants in your system, little metal shavings or filings, and it could destroy everything really quickly. So stop, bring it in, and have it repaired. Loss of power generally is on the high pressure side, so you could have scoring or ridging your rotor group here. You could have a broken link, although that's very rare. You could have um, some scoring in the head of your pump here, or just wear, and that could be creating, letting oil, oil bypass. Also, check this first, make sure your bypass is closed. Somebody could have opened that to move the mower, and now you think it's failed and really there's nothing wrong. So always check that before you panic. Um, so if you have a loss of power situation, either the pump or the motor, you don't want to just guess it's the motor or the pump you want to be sure. And the best way to do that, go to your dealer. Your dealer will have a flow kit that looks like this. And what this is for is it isolates just the pump. So we take the motor out of the picture, we attach this to the pump, you turn up the engine, move the control forwards, and you get a flow here. And there's a specified amount of flow that they're looking for. And then they would increase the pressure to a second pressure point and there would be a very small drop in flow. If there's a big drop in flow, then we know that the pump has an issue for sure. If the pump passes, then we can um, deduce that it's going to be the motor that has the issue. If you don't properly do these diagnostics and say you put a motor on that mower and really it was the pump, then what happens is the bad pump can destroy the new motor you put in, so you would then end up and just from one issue, replacing a pump and two motors, and that can become very costly. You don't want to do that. You want to be sure that you're fixing the component that has the issue. So that's important. Um, generally, if you have, the rule of thumb is generally if you have any issues with the, the metal parts in here on the powder en power end, then you want to just start over with a new component. If you have a leak um, or a bearing, that can usually be repaired with parts, although it's going to cost a lot more in labor. Um, and if, if you have a pumper motor with a lot of hours on it, sometimes even if you may have a leak and it could be repaired, because of the labor, you're better off just replacing the entire component to extend the life more. Also, it can depend on how much longer you plan to be operating that machine. So those are some considerations. Um, so overall, that's diagnostics in a nutshell, things to look out for. And most importantly, if you have an issue, don't keep running the machine. Maintaining the oil in your system is really important. Your oil does a couple things. Uh, it, first off, it cools your system. So when that oil circulates up to the tank, it's helping to cool your hydro system. Also, it takes any contaminants that are system and it brings them down and filters them out. And then lastly, the oil viscosity is actually what helps to find a boundary layer between the different parts in the system. And that boundary layer is really important to keep parts from touching each other. 
And the higher the viscosity, the thicker that boundary layer will be. So that's uh, what the oil does. Now what oil we use, we use a Mobile One 15W50. That's because the additives in this will last real long. Also being a synthetic oil, it's going to have a real consistent um, change in viscosity over temperature. So even though this oil gets hot, it only gets a little bit thinner. Um, you're going to need about three quarts for most mowers. Some mowers will use about two quarts. So good to have about three quarts on hand before you use it. Now in terms of the interval, um, in the past we've recommended that you leave your oil in your system for life and you change the filter every year and, and you just top up the oil a little bit when you do that. Uh, we've seen a few machines that could have really benefited from a replenishment in the additives and so now we're recommending that you change your oil every year or if you're in especially hot or gritty dusty conditions that you change it about 500 hours. In terms of doing the oil change, uh, first off if you get any contamination in your system when you do oil change, it's worse than even changing the oil. So be sure everything's really clean, clean your tools, clean your hands, clean the mower. So I wiped off the top here before I started, took the breather cap off. I'm using a vacuum pump here. When we define an oil change, we're talking about just replenishing the oil in the reservoir. We actually don't want you to replenish the oil down here because that's going to bring air into the system and there's no need for that to, to dry start it. We'd rather you just just do the reservoir. Now, if you're doing an overhaul, you want to flush the system out. So that's when you're going to take all the oil, you're going to drain from the hydro lines. So I'm using a vacuum pump here. That's easy, that's clean. We're just going to drain it down to here. You want to do it when the oil is warm and stirred up, so any contaminants have a better chance of getting pulled out. Once that's empty, you remove your filter. Something that makes it a lot easier is cut a bottle into a scoop shape. Put this up under here, and when you take the filter off, the filter will fall into the oil drain into this first second and you go set this aside. Now for the filter, no matter what brand mower you have, I really recommend you use the OEM filter. Not all filters are made the same, the same specs. You want to use a filter that's spec for your system. Um, you also want to be sure it's in a clean package, so you want to be sure no dust or grit or humidity has gotten to it. Also helps a lot, you write the date that you change, so even if, if your other tracking systems uh, are lost or misplaced, you always know when this was last serviced. So you take the filter off, put a little oil in the gasket, hand tighten it. You don't want any air to leak in here, but it also doesn't have to be grill or tight. Once that's in place, using a clean funnel and your oil, top this up. It's good to fill it just above the sight glass uh, so that when you do your daily check, you can see if the oil level's dropped or if it's still full. You'll put oil in here, open your bypasses, throttle up the engine, move your controls forward backwards about six times, close the bypasses, move them out another six times while the machine's jacked up off the ground. Once you're done, set the machine down. You should expect to hear some of that air coming out of the system for a couple minutes, but within a couple minutes, it should be running quietly. Um, and once that oil's settled out here, double check your fill height, make sure you're full. So that's, that's really all there is to the oil change. It takes a couple minutes, a little bit of pain, but it's important that you do it regularly. It'll really help a lot. How you operate your machine also has a lot to do with how long it will last. Two things that really will deteriorate a system quicker are heat and pressure. So how do you reduce your peak pressures? You can reduce your peak pressures by not hot rotting, so that's hard starts or wheelies on asphalt. That's really not good for your hydro system. And then the other thing is climbing or dismounting curbs aggressively. It's best to get on the curb gently and climb down the curb gently because a sudden jolt will put the whole weight of your machine into pressure and um, will shorten the life of your system. In terms of heat, uh, generally what's going to create heat in your system is if there's uh, a lot of debris built up around the motor or the pump or where the fan is or if your machine has an oil cooler if it's plugged. You want to be sure that your machine is breathing and it has uh, as much air flow through it as possible. The other thing that produces heat is when the machine runs really hard. So one of the hardest things for your machine is going up and down a slope continuously. Continuously or maybe after about 20 minutes. After 20 minutes you're going to hit that peak temperature. So if you're going up and down hill, try not to go full speed, try to ease it back a little bit. Or will actually make you more productive and leave a better finish if the slope is not too steep is, steep is to go side to side. So if you start at the bottom of a slope and you go back and forth climbing the slope, it's actually better for your machine you have less scuffing on the turf 
and it'll be quicker because you can make uphill turns more quickly and safely than downhill turns. So hopefully those few tips will help you know how to operate your machine to get the most from it. So here's the major takeaways from this. First off, properly maintain your machine. Good clean oil and a good filter will help maximize the life of your system and keeping a good oil boundary between all the parts. Secondly, train all your guys to not abuse the equipment. So keep those temperatures down, keep those pressures down, it'll be better for the machine, the hydros, the engine, the tires, everything. Also, if you have a leak, generally that can be repaired. If you have a major loss of power in the pump or motor, be sure that is properly diagnosed so you end up replacing the correct part. Hopefully this information helps you get the most from your machine. If you've learned anything else, be sure to put that in the comments and share it. Thank you.